Uncharted 4 was developed by Naughty Dog and released in May of this year as a PlayStation 4 exclusive. It is supposedly the final entry in the series. If you're interested in the games but never had a chance to play them, you should know that my previous video was a summary of the original trilogy, along with The Last of Us thrown in there. If you'd like to fully understand all the points made in this video, I highly recommend that you watch that one first, or have played the games yourself. Either will do. Likewise, I'll be spoiling almost everything about these five games in these videos. I'll be going into detail on gameplay and some of the major set pieces in this video, and into great detail on the story and puzzles in the next one. If you want my quick opinion before stopping, I think that Uncharted 4 is the best in the series by a significant margin, but it's not nearly as good as The Last of Us. It has almost the same problems that Uncharted 1 through 3 had, with the main improvement being found in its story. Gameplay is a bit more mixed, and we'll be getting to that right away in this video. So to repeat, spoiler warning. Hold on! Gameplay is the part of these games that I usually see the most disagreement on. Like I said in the previous video, some people really, really love these games. Some are in the middle and think they're light fun. Others hate them so much that they don't think they should even be considered video games at all. The biggest criticism the series gets is that it isn't interactive enough. Even those that think that will still acknowledge that the games excel in other areas, that the visuals and presentation are fantastic. The stories may be hit or miss, but the dialogue and acting tied to its characters is also great. Love to know what you're thinking. I'm thinking you're lucky that I found you when I did. A lot of action in certain sequences is also undeniably exciting to look at, even if it isn't always interesting to play. So to start, let's separate all the different things that you'll be doing while you play Uncharted 4. We'll move aside story right now since it's almost always movies or conversations that run without any input from the player. Combat is up next, which is either shooting or punching your way through large groups of enemies, or using stealth to take down as many of them as you can without being spotted. For exploration, large sections of the game are devoted to walking or climbing through an area without any of this combat. Set pieces combine parts of these two to make some sort of unique action scene, along with chase sequences that have you moving through a level with urgency, often under the threat of some force you can't fight, like an armored truck or a building that's collapsing. Finally, there are puzzles, which feel like the least used portion of gameplay on this list. At most, it's used about the same amount as the set pieces, which are also uncommon. Most of the game is story, combat, and walking and climbing. And I'd argue that those last two take up the most time in the game. Just running around looking for the right way forward, or climbing on the outside of buildings or cliffs, is what you'll be doing more than anything else. Now the sights are a bit more enjoyable that way. Uncharted 4 also brings some changes to the series. For exploration, you have a few areas that are far larger than anything in the first three games. There's a lot more freedom to decide how you want to go through it all, and some extras to find that aren't just hidden short paths tucked away on the linear route that you're meant to follow. The best example being your arrival at Madagascar about one third of the way into the game. You can drive around to different parts of this wide open area. You're still guided towards specific points that are usually marked with drops down to a lower path that you can't climb up afterwards. Oh, Jesus. Oh, my spine. This signals them as points of no return, and therefore the correct way forward. There are quite a few optional areas in this section, as well as some others that might initially appear like the way you're meant to go, but end up being detours instead. It adds a small amount of depth to how you get through this chapter, and it's a welcome, if minor, change from what's come before it. For the climbing and acrobatic parts, you have three new additions that have been borrowed from the new Tomb Raider series. Now before anyone has a chance to get mad that I'm saying that, I am well aware that those games copied Uncharted first, just like Drake's Fortune was ridiculed as being Dude Raider to Lara Croft's Tomb Raider. It's fine for games to learn from each other, I'm pointing it out so people can better understand the changes, and also because I think it's interesting what one developer will draw from another. The three things are a grapple hook, which is given a lot freer use than what Lara does in Rise of the Tomb Raider. These are context sensitive moments in Uncharted 4, with Nathan throwing the hook in many situations, while hanging on a wall, or falling, or in the middle of a jump. Next up is the climbing spike, which you find near the end of the game, that can act as an anchor point on certain walls, so you can use it to bridge gaps between grip points that would otherwise be too far away. Lastly are sliding sections, which I think 2013's Tomb Raider did a decent job at using. Uncharted 4 arguably does this better, they're used quite often and are present right from the start and all the way to the end. 
These new additions all have something in common, their attempts at providing more player control. The open areas give some light decisions and optional paths. The grapple hook requires timing from the player or else they'll fall and die. Same goes for stabbing the spike into the wall during the middle of a jump. And you can shift left or right while sliding, which is often required so you can position yourself for another jump at the end. Early on in the game are parts that you need to get high up on a slope so that you have enough time to slide down to the other side to the only part that you can climb up. Later in the game there are ever so slightly more complicated jumps over pits that kill you if you don't line it up right. Compare this to the standard in the first three games, which was all about nudging Nathan along the only path available to him, and you can see the difference. The issue is that these long stretches of climbing, with the player moving from handhold to handhold, with the game holding their hand the whole time too, are still present in Uncharted 4, in fact I felt that there were more of them than ever. There's no decision making here, there is rarely an incorrect way forward, and there's no careful timing that's required for these jumps. Nathan's hands become magnetic instead and he snaps from one to the next, to the point that the game's rules about how high or far he can jump are often inconsistent, because there's no real set maximum that he can do. It's all about what the scripted, predetermined result is that the developer decided on before you even picked up the controller. The new additions aren't enough to make these parts fun, they could have been, but they're unfortunately not utilized in any way to engage the player in any lasting capacity. At least they weren't enough to engage me, you may have to push a button in order to throw a rope at the correct time, but the window on the button prompt is generous enough and also predictable enough that this was never a challenge nor interesting. The final acrobatic section of the game, which is minutes before the finale, is the only time that Uncharted 4 ever flirts with the idea of straining the player with all of these concepts. There's a lot of wall climbing here that moves to rope swings, into timing the climbing pick on a landing, into multiple rope swings back to back that end in a slope when you land, which builds into a series of timing tests and controller inputs in a row instead of separately dotting them in between the usual dull magnetic climbing jumps. This part of the game was enjoyable, and I think it's a real shame that it took so long for the complexity to reach this point, and that the game ends right after it. The culprit here might be that the climbing pick is given to the player so late, well into the last third of the game, because earlier on, in the long stretch of time that you spend in Scotland, there are quite a few sliding sections that near this level of fun. There's some actual thought and timing involved in how you pick the correct path and time to jump, so that you can slide down and reach the next area. This was an engaging concept that unfortunately isn't expanded on at all. The game never reaches further than this, and either maintains this level or dips below it back to the boring snappy climbing. I can't help but think back to the Prince of Persia reboot, The Sands of Time. That game had similar climbing sections. The graphics are really dated now, of course, but I'm sure you can see the resemblance. Here there's even a part when you're shimmying along a narrow ledge and parts of it arbitrarily crumble away, so you have to keep dropping down or climbing up to a different path. You aren't actually in any danger, but it might look like you are before you realize the game is toying with you. The difference is Sands of Time builds on this to create more complicated sections of running and climbing. There are acrobatic arenas that require actual timing on the player's part to use different moves and options to get through it all. Whether that's a series of jumps or running along a wall and kicking away at the right time instead of magnetically flipping over like the game decided it should be playing for you. There was even a rewind function built into the game in order to make these sections less frustrating since you could so easily mess it up. And I'm not trying to say that Sands of Time was a perfect game, it had its own mess of issues, the camera definitely being one of them, but it steadily increased its demands on the player in these sequences and didn't constantly waste your time with meaningless climbs and jumps. And it did all of this in 2003, 13 years before Uncharted 4. Because unfortunately, the walking around and climbing in this game is still playing by the rules of the previous entries in the series. They aim to be visually interesting instead of mechanically. It's all about the spectacle, the eye candy of what's going on around you, as well as how fluid all the animations are as you swing or slide around. Just like the game also follows in another tradition, constantly reminding you to appreciate that spectacle. These burns had a nice view before he was executed. Look at that view. Man. <laughs> Feast your eyes, gentlemen. Wow. Spectacular. Just imagine. Ah, you okay back there? You keep your pace, I'll keep mine. Yeah, well, at least you got a great view, right? <laughs> well, that was fun. Wow. Well, this is a nice view. How you doing back there? It's a hell of a view. 
Nathan, you seeing this tower? Sure am. It doesn't help that this is the lion's share of what you'll be doing when you're in control of Nathan while playing. It's broken up enough by combat, story, and set pieces that it never becomes exhaustingly boring, but it does start to wear thin as the game goes on since so little is required of you. Imagine for a moment if, when playing the original Mario Brothers, the game would freeze when you got close to an enemy and wouldn't continue until you hit A. Then the game would do the jump for you, same for jumping over pipes and pits. That's how climbing is handled in Uncharted 4. Combat hasn't been given any new major additions, except for the ability to mark enemies in order to track them. This makes clearing an area with only stealth much easier to execute. It also appeared to me like many more combat sections could be finished with only stealth, instead of pretending like they could, but they really have to end in a gunfight for you to proceed like in the previous games. The biggest change to all of this, in my opinion, is level design. How much more work went into making these combat arenas interesting. There's a lot less instances of you being thrown into some area that feels slapped together with questionably placed cover and told to have fun. You're fighting around some sort of interesting building or ruins or a pile of wrecked ships instead. There's a lot more vertical layers to it all with jumps and hooks to use your rope on and cliffs to hang from, both for stealth and a more crazy version of cover. It's like they took the ship graveyard from Uncharted 3 as the template for the whole game. The result is something that's a lot more fun to traverse while you're in the middle of a gunfight or sneaking around. These options are good, and they can also be used against you if you're spotted, since enemies can run around and try and flank you from all these different routes and sides. It's a real wasted opportunity then that similar work wasn't done to make the actual fighting more interesting. Melee combat is still just mashing square and triangle. It looks as great as ever, with characters smoothly transitioning to help each other with fantastic looking animations. Same goes for using the environment around you in a reactive way, as seen in the video playing right now. But no matter how good this looks, it's just a prettier quick time event that doesn't always flash the button prompt in your face. Stealth may have gotten a little attention, but there's no other tools at your disposal other than marking enemies. Even then, that's not a big one. You'll still be waiting around a hell of a lot, either to learn when enemies are looking at certain areas, or for some of them to patrol away so you can sneak in for a kill. There's something almost puzzle-like about some of these parts, with you learning which guard is the first one you should take down in order not to be spotted, which, after he's dead, means that another one now has a moment that he's vulnerable to be killed without being seen. It's like finding a weak link in a chain that causes another weakness when it's broken. If the entire game was built around this, preferably with some simple time manipulation system so you don't spend so much time hanging around doing literally nothing, then that would be the foundation for some potentially interesting gameplay. As it is now, it's a little more enjoyable than the previous games, but like the climbing, it's also dumbed down to the point that stuff like this can happen. Somehow, the guy didn't see the 180 pound man falling through the air like a penguin that forgot it couldn't fly. It would be wrong of me not to say that this problem isn't found on higher difficulties though, which is a good time to explain the two playthroughs I had at the game. My first time through I went on moderate. In order to properly judge a game, I think you should always play it at least twice. Sometimes though, if the game is simple, one time through is enough. Normal is your best bet initially since it's the experience that most players will go for and you need to relate to that if you're going to do a review. Afterward, it's always worth it to test the game's mechanics on a harder difficulty setting. It doesn't always have to be the hardest setting since many games have mechanics and features that flat out break on the highest difficulty. But playing a game on harder above can often show you things that you might have missed. You can be forced to really learn how parts of the game work when you can't just blindly stumble your way through it, or stumble your way through blind guards in this case. So my second playthrough was on crushing, which is as high as Uncharted 4 goes. Just for the sake of comparison, here's how that rope swing went the second time. It's a pretty big difference, and it felt a lot better in terms of guards reacting to things. This is the standard on this hardest difficulty setting. The other big change is that you can't mark targets anymore. Besides that, damage is pumped up along with enemy perception, and that's it. The climbing, puzzles, and set pieces are unchanged. Difficulty options really only affect gun combat. So let's talk about that. Like I said, it's a lost opportunity that more changes weren't made to combat mechanics, because all of these different paths around the more creative combat arenas don't mean a hell of a lot when you're stuck behind cover, zoom down iron sights in order to properly shoot. 
It's still all about managing time that you're exposed to gunfire and shooting back at enemies and then staying behind cover for your health to recharge before cycling through it all over again. That's all there is to do when you're in a gunfight. Sometimes the cover will be destructible and force you to move somewhere else, sometimes a grenade will be thrown at you and will force the same thing, but there are so many places to hide, many of which have permanent unbreakable cover, that it doesn't really matter. For a game that's all about movement outside of combat, it's a shame that this isn't the same story while fighting. Now, in the past, I've argued in defense of hitscan weapons and regenerating health. It's not the best thing that shooters can be, but it does have some merits and can lead to fun gameplay, but that doesn't hold true here. Imagine if this game was about avoiding gunfire by testing the player to move around it. Imagine using the grapple hook in the middle of a fight and guiding a swing through enemy projectiles. Imagine using all those movement options in a fight. Or there could be some sort of mechanic that rewards a lot of movement with a damage shield so that you could keep building into some sort of momentum as you fight. It could be rationalized as a luck meter for enemy shooting Drake, but missing as his luck is used up, like a few people have suggested as a way to explain why his health regenerates. It even matches some action movies since the hero never seems to get hit as long as he's charging around. It's one of the most well-known tropes about those movies. Same goes for aiming, which is where things become more complicated. See, I'm not exactly sure how aiming even works in this game, and I'm hoping that some of the footage playing will show what I mean when I slow it down. In some games, weapons have crosshairs that expand the more you fire, in order to tell you that your shots are becoming increasingly less accurate the more you shoot. You have to do controlled bursts instead of just holding your button down. In other games, your crosshairs are rock steady and always indicate where they'll land, no matter if you're still or running. The issue I have with Iron Sights is how most developers have reacted to it. It's given them a reason to make it so firing from the hip is a random flailing mess and largely a waste of time and ammunition. You should be using the always pinpoint accurate Iron Sights while looking down the gun instead. Now, I like the idea of Iron Sights. I thought Fallout 3 felt really weird without that feature and was happy when New Vegas added it but iron sights already have an advantage in that you're zoomed in closer to better aim. Firing from the hip should still be useful, especially since it's the only way to have the player be able to move quickly while shooting. Like many games, Uncharted 4 drastically limits Nathan's speed when he's aiming like this. The Last of Us had this as the only way to fire, and that suited the slower pace of that game. Uncharted's ridiculous action shouldn't be tied down in the same way. To get back to what I was saying, many games use their target reticule as a sort of rough area of estimation. Here is a square or a circle representation of where your shots could land. You can see this in action in Uncharted 4 when you fire from the hip. It's a random chance in this possible area where your bullets end up going. It's a random uncontrollable spray on this area. When aiming in iron sights, however, you still have something close to this, a circle on your screen, which might lead you to believe that it's the same as the hip fire, just a smaller, tighter version for the possible chances your bullet might go as a more accurate reward for committing to aiming and slower movement. But if you look at my examples here, the bullets always land right in the middle of where I'm aiming. It's like there's a second invisible marker in the exact middle of the circle that the bullets are always driven toward. So that appears like it isn't random at all, and that the circle is there as a guide to better line up exact shots for the center point. However, this isn't really the case when you're fighting. Sometimes enemies are only partly in the target, and they still get hit. Sometimes there isn't even part of them close to the center where the bullet should apparently be going. Likewise, there are times that part of the enemy really is in the middle of the target and doesn't get hit. Now this leans back toward the outcome being random within this area, but it could also be that hitboxes on enemies are different than their visual size might indicate, or that it's just buggy. I don't think random chance on gunfire is a good thing, especially if you have to slow down gameplay to make it happen. Accurate hipfire alone would be a grand improvement in my opinion, since it would allow players to move quickly while lining up shots, which requires a lot more skill to do at the same time than constantly stopping and shooting zoomed in. You could do a lot more cool and challenging things while moving through these layered arenas if you could shoot properly while you were moving. I know that I might be alone in this, and there's something to be said about properly choosing the right time to look down the sights and skillfully shoot enemies quickly, snapping from target to target in and out of iron sights, that sometimes feels good. But it feels really limited to me, and I'm not saying that this is the only way combat could be improved in this game, it's just the best idea that I can come up with to be constructive about criticizing it. It may also be seen as too big of a departure from what came before in the series, since you'd have to find a way to rationalize why Nathan can suddenly move in a way that dodges bullets or has superhuman accuracy, but the game already showed that it was willing to do a dramatic departure from what came before with the hook rope. Yeah, good luck, Bell. I mean, that's almost impossible to- oh, you did it. Nice. That's in Uncharted 2. The first real scene in Uncharted 4 is when Nathan is a young boy, and it shows that even back then he was able to use his grapple line better than Tenzin did in Among Thieves. Yet he never thought to bring something so useful in 20 years of adventuring until now. 
Similar changes could be made to combat to make it fun, instead of it being like walking and climbing is, filler between story and set pieces. I thought that playing the game on crushing might change things, ultimately it made the game worse. Damage is spiked so high that there's no way that you can play recklessly and weave in some moments of daredevil rope swinging or brawling. You have to really learn how to use cover and aim quickly and efficiently to minimize how long you're exposed to damage and to make the most out of your limited ammunition. I'd be lying if I said there weren't a few battles that were made more intense because of these changes, but it was a cheap sort of tension since you can die so quickly that it's not always your fault. How much damage you take when you're not hiding behind cover is random, as you can see here with these jumps I do over and over again as I restart to get through this area. Sometimes I take hardly any damage, sometimes I'm close to dead by the time I hit the ground. Because of this variance, every time you pop your head up to shoot at enemies, which you have to do in order to get through sections and exposing yourself is unavoidable, you could end up close to dying after firing off just one or two shots. If this so happens to line up with a grenade being thrown at you, or being flanked by a new enemy entering the battle, then you're just dead with no way of reacting or predicting what you're meant to do aside from trial and error. The game has frequent checkpoints and restarts to help with this, but it doesn't stop the game from feeling cheap. I did beat the game on crushing, but I came close to giving up near the end. The game cheats. It allows the guards to become superhuman, they can leap great distances like you can see right now, which not even Nathan Drake can do if you try to pull off the same thing. This means that you can't always rely on using the environment in clever ways to protect yourself from flanking, since the game makes it so guards can do impossible things to get at you. Enemies also become ridiculously accurate from insane distances, with the guys in power armor stomping around like they got lost from Fallout 4 instead of Uncharted 4. Like, seriously, look at these, what the hell are they doing in this game? They're the worst defenders for both sniper-like shots and insane damage from their miniguns. This makes the game more tedious rather than a fun challenge, and also encourages more use of stealth. What's funny is that damage also becomes inconsistent because there's not always cover in some of the set pieces, so moments like the car chase halfway through the game suddenly have different rules because otherwise it would be impossible while you're pulling yourself onto the truck. You just die too quickly before you could shoot back at the baseline level of damage crushing is meant to deal you. But even this is inconsistent since I still died in a later set piece because this adjustment wasn't in place. You're meant to run straight ahead and not fight the small army across the collapsed building. And even following directions like I was meant to, the game still killed me and had to restart. Ultimately, I'd recommend playing on normal, since the combat never has enough depth to be enjoyable in its intended form. Normal gives you enough health that you can mess around with more sloppy attacks, you can screw around with the combat system, it's more stupid fun and closer to the action movie that the games try to emulate. Leap around humming the Spider-Man theme and punch as many people as you can. So that's most of the gameplay in Uncharted 4, which, at the risk of repeating myself, I consider to be mostly filler between the more interesting set pieces that Naughty Dog liked to make and the story that they put a monumental amount of effort into presenting better than almost any other game out there. To speak about those set pieces, I think it's important to first define them. In the previous games, they were the car chase in Drake's Fortune, the tank and convoy sequence in Among Thieves, then the sinking ship and the plane crash in Drake's Deception. These aren't the only set pieces in the trilogy, but they're enough to show how much they stand out compared to the rest of the gameplay you'll be doing. It's a neat trick that you still control Nathan as you normally do in these sequences, and often have to do some jumping, climbing, and cover-based shooting in the middle of this unique situation, so you can easily adapt to what's going on. The key differences are how much the spectacle around you is ramped up to 11, and that there's this sense of urgency constantly pushing you forward. What's actually happening is that the cool visuals are no different than anything else in the other sequences, it just looks more flashy, and that sense of urgency isn't really danger as it is you being pushed or pulled down a specific set of actions that the game requires from you. There's a moment early on in Uncharted 4 that sums up this idea quite nicely, how you're not allowed to deviate from the plan the game has for you. The set pieces in Uncharted 4 are surprisingly disappointing compared to Uncharted 2 and 3. They were still enjoyable because, as much as it might have just sounded like I was criticizing them for just this reason, the spectacle on offer really is impressive, and there's enough actions expected of you that you feel like you're controlling an actor in a scene in a movie. It ties back to what I said in my summary of the previous games, it's not my favorite thing that games can do, but it's still entertaining. The two main problems I have with Uncharted 4 set pieces are that there aren't enough of them, and that a lot of them felt very similar. 
Most of them are chases, escaping the prison at the beginning, then the crumbling chamber in Scotland, then a short fall down a clock tower, with another similar sequence down another tower that's falling apart later on in the game. The trend is a lot of things breaking and blowing apart around you, that's the default that most of the set pieces follow. The exceptions are the mid-game set piece in Madagascar, and the chase near the end of the game with the armored truck. Now both of these are good, but they're the only ones that stand out in my memory as distinctly different than the others, and there's only two of them. There's nothing like the train, sinking ship, or plane sequence from the previous games. There's nothing really new or surprising here either. The set pieces are ones they've already done before, just with some tweaks and visual updates. That doesn't mean they're bad. The short but sweet truck chase near the game's finale felt genuinely awesome to play through. I know it's all an illusion, but it felt like a struggle at the time, and that I was making quick decisions and constantly being hounded by this mechanical monstrosity. Like it was an animal gnashing at my heels. It felt great. <laughs> Likewise for the incredibly well done scene in the middle of the game, which was unfortunately spoiled by one of the game's first trailers. This is undoubtedly the game's crowning moment in terms of action and visuals. It moves from one of the more interesting shootouts with you pinned down in the market, to then driving down the streets of the city while the truck chases you. Again, I know this is an illusion, you're not really in a head-to-head -head battle with this thing as you drive, you're being guided and funneled instead, down predetermined roads and paths that only have a few options that always end up going to the same place but it's still cool to watch and more interesting to play than much of the combat, and it's arguably a set piece that does try to do something new since you're in control of the car this time around. This is only half of it however because this sequence keeps going, there's another transition to Uncharted 4's version of the convoy scene from Among Thieves and Drake's Deception. I think I still prefer the horseback version in the third game as my favourite, but this one was pretty good. Like I said in my previous video, this convoy idea is probably used multiple times because it actually gives the player options different targets to shoot, different methods to progress along the convoy. Do you jump forward from truck to truck, or jump sideways to steal a car for yourself? You can shoot the drivers chasing you, blow out the tires on the motorcycles, or use the car to ram them away. It unfortunately makes it glaringly obvious how few options there are in other set pieces, but it's still exciting to play through. There's a fourth and final transition to what is functionally a movie. You're a passenger on a motorbike and finally take down the armored truck in a big crash. The whole thing from starting market to final explosion is so ridiculously over the top even for this series, which is actually linked to the game's story in a way that I really like, which of course we'll get to in the next video. Yet these set pieces are really just quick time events that have had a lot of work put into them to hide the button prompts, and instead guide the player into making the right decision instead, which is why they can feel so awful and artificial when you somehow miss those cues or choose to ignore them and try something on your own instead, which is a big no-no in the series, it never wants any creative thinking from you. Doing this can be so bad that it can destroy how you see the game in certain situations. A scene later on has you searching through containers to find something to pry open a door. There's a time limit here, since one of your friends is stalling an auction in the building while you find a way to break in and turn off the power. I wanted to see how high the bidding war could actually get, so I purposefully let this run, and in the end the game has to switch to a movie scene in which a guard just randomly appears and shoots you without giving you any chance to fight back. It's like the game gets mad and punishes you. God damn it. It's even better since by doing this I learned that the crowbar you find is always in a different spot, and always the fifth container or so that you search, in order to give this illusion of tension as you continually fail to find it. Nothing. Damn it. There's a river later on in the game that you can jump into, the current carries you along and as you can clearly see it's moving in one direction. But very quickly the game realizes that you've skipped the part you were meant to do first, and shoots you suddenly back against the current so you can get back onto the game's script. To me the worst of these is the armored truck, you can't fight this thing, your bullets do no damage, and just like in other Naughty Dog games, if you think you're smart about getting close to it so you can hide under its guns then the game just instantly kills you without having the decency to pretend like you got shot at. What I really hate about this is that, at the end of this part, the game decides that bullets suddenly should do damage to the truck after all, and you have to shoot it as you're driven away, yet earlier on you can unload entire magazines worth of bullets and even some grenades and the thing takes no damage. The game never gives the player a chance to be creative, it never goes to the trouble of thinking how to react to what you might want to do, and the fights with Nadine are another great example of this, but I think that's better to go through in the next video when we talk about the story. Have you had enough? Or do you want to keep being a smartass? When you buy into the illusion though and meet the games halfway, the set pieces can be just as fun as those in the previous games in the series, even when you know it's so scripted. Like I said, I still do like this part with the truck overall, it's just a shame to me that there weren't more ideas used. Some of them that flirt with some potential, like the two times that your car goes veering off the road, over a cliff and then into a river later on, 
are so short that they're honestly quite forgettable. I almost didn't think to include them in this part of the video. They're so different, but so brief they don't matter. And I think that's all of it, aside from puzzles, which we'll be briefly stopping to look at as we go through the game's story. I hope that this look at gameplay in Uncharted 4 has shown how limited it is, from the barebone stealth mechanics to the equally minimalist gun combat and the legitimately boring climbing sections. I feel like these are used as padding to act as time to bridge the story parts and set pieces together, or that the game has so much of this bland gameplay because that's just what video games are supposed to have, and they felt obligated to have some sort of gameplay loop that you do over and over, and didn't think to spend time making it interesting. But I really have to wonder if it's that simple. See, the thing is, I've been playing and thinking about these games for almost two months now, it's been my own personal circle of hell. My last video was over three hours long, and I had to play some parts of the games multiple times, not to mention the crushing playthrough of Uncharted 4. I kept thinking more about it as I went through all the work of putting that giant video together, considering what points I wanted to expand on in this video, especially gameplay since it's not something I went into detail on. And the kind of awkward conclusion that I've come to is that I can't ignore how much effort Naughty Dog puts into their games, how the presentation pushes the entire industry forward. The careful construction of their set pieces and committing to this idea of a playable movie sequence with as few intrusions from button prompts as possible. The grand attempts at having a great story in The Last of Us and now Uncharted 4. A lot of this is deliberate. The games don't always succeed, but it's clear that effort goes into an earnest try. And what this conclusion means to me is that this sort of bland, basic gameplay is also deliberate. That the game is meant to be this simple. That they didn't want deep gameplay. It's meant to be light entertainment that, at least in the first two games, matches the tone of the story. In a way, it feels like the series is targeting people that like to play games, but don't play a lot of games. They're heavily polished, visually thrilling, entry-level titles, and I think that's okay. It's entertaining. It's a little troubling that they review so mind-blowingly well if I'm right, considering the target audience and those responsible for scoring games shouldn't overlap, ever, but maybe that's a topic that isn't worth disturbing in a video like this. In the end, that's how I view Uncharted now. It's like Pacific Rim or The Avengers. It's a great, dumb, visually exciting action movie that you can enjoy. It's not high art, it's not the best thing film can be, but it can still be worth your time. Either way, thank you for watching. As I said too many times, story will be up next. It should be available a few days after this video, so unless you're watching this immediately after it was uploaded, chances are the next video is already on the channel for you to watch if you want to get to it right now. As always, please subscribe to see more videos. Patreon is here if you'd like to show some support and make sure that it's possible for those new videos to get made. You could also follow me on Twitter for updates on what's next or tweet at me with suggestions for games you'd like me to look at. I'll see you next time. I think Rise of the Tomb Raider is better.